The legendary French statesman Charles de Gaulle was renowned for his wartime heroics and strong leadership as president of France in a time of great turmoil and change. But as the 1960s wore on, his heavy-handed style did not sit comfortably with thousands of radicalized students and intellectuals who were chafing at the restrictions and prejudices of the previous generation. In May 1968, discontent erupted in Paris. By the time it was over, France had been transformed. The problems first surfaced in March of that year, when a group of students, poets and musicians occupied an administration building at Nanterre University to protest against class discrimination and university bureaucracy. They surrendered without incident, but unrest continued to build until it spilled into the streets two months later. After a rowdy protest, police fired tear gas into a crowd of students at the Sorbonne University and were forced to arrest hundreds of people as students flocked to the site in solidarity. Schools and universities across the nation were shut down and put under police guard. The situation escalated when 10 million workers went on strike to support the protests and more than a million people marched through Paris. The problem grew so big that the government called a snap election. At one point, de Gaulle was even forced to seek refuge at a German Air Force base. France teetered on the brink of revolution and the riots inspired similar actions around the world. Finally, the situation dissipated and police withdrew from the universities. Students quickly occupied the Sorbonne again until police retook it on the 16th of June. De Gaulle won an overwhelming victory at the subsequent elections, but his presidency had been fatally weakened. He resigned in 1969 and died suddenly in 1970, two weeks before his 80th birthday. Coming up, the hijack that ended at Dawson's Field. It became known as Black September, the month of the lives of hundreds of aeroplane passengers lay in the balance. More than 300 people were taken hostage when Palestinian extremists hijacked four airliners between September the 6th and September the 9th, 1970. Three of the flights landed at Dawson's Field, a desert airstrip the militants renamed Revolution Airport. On September the 12th, they blew up the three aircraft to demonstrate their resolution moments after the last 40 passengers left the aircraft. The dramatic footage of massive jet fuel explosions and billowing smoke mesmerized the world television audience and put greater pressure on the affected governments. The People's Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a segment of the Palestine Liberation Organization, said it had taken the drastic step because it believed military action was about to be launched to retake the planes. The guerrillas were constantly battling Jordanian forces in the streets of Amman, with the hotel housing most of the hostages taking heavy fire. Although the terrorists had successfully captured two flights, with the third brought in later by an unaffiliated sympathizer, two hijackings did not go as planned. The taking of LL Flight 219 was foiled when pilot Uri Bar-Lev put the Boeing 707 into steep nosedive and threw the two terrorists off balance. The flight landed safely at Heathrow, where Leila Khaled was taken into custody. The other would-be hijacker, Patrick Arguello, died from injuries received during the struggle. A fourth flight refueled in Beirut, where another nine militants boarded the plane and diverted to Cairo after its pilots successfully convinced the hijackers that the 747 was too big to land in the desert. It was wired with explosives and blown up a few moments after the passengers disembarked. The PFLP's demands included the release of Leila Khaled and Palestinian prisoners in Germany, Switzerland and Israel within 72 hours. At a press conference in Amman, the Marxist-Leninist group transfixed the world as it outlined its manifesto. To make it clear to the whole world that PFLP is not a bloodthirsty organization we have released all women and children, and sick, gradually since the first day. PFLP had also transferred the rest, that is the 40 passengers, 
who are classified as suspects under interrogation or hostages by the revolution have transferred them <coughs> into a more cozy place. Nevertheless, these people are now living in much better conditions than that on the airfield or in our refugee camps. And they will be kept there until our prisoners are released. PFLP had destroyed completely today the three planes, practicing one of its strategical lines to hit the imperialist and Zionist interests all over the world. And in reaction to the stand of the imperialist and Zionist powers. Behind the scenes, there was tension between allies Britain and the United States after British Prime Minister Edward Heath decided to secretly negotiate with the terrorists. US President Richard Nixon, on the other hand, favored direct military action. He instructed his Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, to arrange for PFLP positions to be bombed in retaliation for the hijackings. However, Laird told his president inclement weather made this impossible. He later admitted that this was an excuse to avoid carrying out the order, as he thought it would damage American interests given the country was already fighting a debilitating war in Vietnam. Nixon also announced that armed air marshals would travel on U.S. commercial flights and that security would be stepped up at U.S. airports. Calling hijacking piracy of the skies, he called on the international community to suspend airline services with countries that refused to punish or extradite hijackers. The British government quickly assessed that a military solution was impractical and concentrated on resolving the standoff through diplomacy. It successfully negotiated an extension of the 72-hour deadline, and six days later, after an assurance that Khaled would be freed, most of the women and children were released. Jordan's leader, King Hussein, ended his policy of tolerating Palestinian militant activities in his country and launched an all-out war on the Palestinian Liberation Organization. The situation reached crisis point when Syrian tanks crossed the border. Hussein took the unprecedented step of secretly requesting that Israel launch a counter-strike, an appeal it denied. Within a year, the PLO had been driven from Jordan and set up headquarters in Lebanon, an act that was to have bloody consequences for that country. But the PFLP judged the hijackings a success. Spokesman Bassam Abu Sharif recalled the confusion among some of the American passengers who had no sense of the geography or history of the Middle East. One man thought they'd landed in Africa. No, Abu Sharif told him, you are in Jordan, and we are Palestinian guerrillas. The man had never heard of Palestine. By the time the situation was resolved, many more Americans knew about the Palestinians' grievances. The events of Black September were the prelude to a more violent chapter in the struggle for the Palestinian cause. The 1970s saw several more hijacks and some deadly actions, including the massacre of Israeli athletes at the 1972 Munich Olympics and the murder of 27 people in the lobby of Israel's Lod Airport. Leila Khaled now lives in Jordan with her husband and sons and has renounced her support of hijacking as a valid means of protest. However, she says she stands by her actions in 1970 and believes the hijackings brought the Palestinian cause to world attention and demonstrated that governments could be held to ransom when the lives of their citizens were under threat. After the Dawson's Field hijackings, air travel was never the same again. Coming up, Naomi Campbell's costly temper tantrum. World-famous supermodel Naomi Campbell attracts attention wherever she goes. Since starting on the catwalk at the tender age of 15, Campbell has built a lucrative career in the beauty industry. She's appeared on the cover of Vogue, posed nude for Playboy, and starred in a string of music videos. Her ghost-written novel Swan was a bestseller, 
and she's worked on many charity projects for the people of sub-Saharan Africa. Campbell counts former South African leader Nelson Mandela as one of her friends. But as well as her exotic beauty, the model is also renowned for her fiery temper, a tray that has got into hot water on more than one occasion. In 2000, Campbell pleaded guilty to assaulting her assistant Georgina Galanis with a phone. The Toronto court cleared her record in exchange for her expression of remorse. Just six years later, Campbell was back in court, this time accused of attacking her housekeeper, Anna Scabolino, with a jewel-encrusted mobile phone after becoming enraged over a missing pair of jeans. The housekeeper was treated for a head injury following the incident. Campbell did not appear at the initial hearing, and a bench warrant was issued for her arrest. But after her lawyer explained why she couldn't attend, Manhattan Criminal Court Judge Evelyn Laporte took back the warrant. The case was adjourned to November the 15th, 2006. The defense and prosecution were unsuccessful in cutting a deal, so the supermodel was forced to front court on the agreed date, clad demurely in a stylish, figure-hugging black dress. Her lawyer said Campbell hoped to reach an agreement that would only require community service. The model faced up to seven years in prison and deportation back to Britain if convicted on an assault charge. The defense attorney also said he didn't want Campbell in a situation like 80s musical icon Boy George, who was followed by reporters when he did community service for the sanitation department after pleading guilty to falsely reporting a burglary. He said Campbell was fully aware of the gravity of the situation. Naomi is taking it seriously, but um, I don't think that's any big whoop because no one who's gone through the system, who's been arrested and fingerprinted and photographed and brought in front of a judge and bail was set, uh, no one under those circumstances takes these things cavalierly. It's a, it's a very, very serious situation. Campbell was also hit with a lawsuit from another former employee who said the British model viciously assaulted her while calling her a dumb Romanian. The lawsuit by Gabby Gibson called Campbell a violent super bigot. Gibson said the model hit her, called her names, and threatened to charge her with theft after being unable to find a pair of jeans designed by Stella McCartney. The maid worked for Campbell from November 2005 to January 2006. In 2007, a judge denied a legal attempt by the model's lawyers to bar her ex-maid from raising prior examples of her allegedly chronic abusive and repeatedly violent conduct towards her employees. The case has yet to be resolved. Campbell's lawyer said the allegations against his client did not fit the pattern of the supermodel's history of altruism, which has seen her involved in a number of worthy causes. But she's also constantly contributing to the public at large, whether it be cancer research or whether or not it be AIDS research or whether or not it be for, um, for providing for underprivileged children like the, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. Uh, all over the world, she has done a magnificent job to, to, to circumvent all of that and suggest that she's a discriminating individual or a, a hateful individual is, is just absurd. It just doesn't fit within the, within the fabric. On the matter of the telephone assault, Campbell's defense team struck a deal with the prosecution that saw the supermodel pleading guilty to reckless assault in exchange for five days of community service. Campbell served her sentence at a New York City sanitation department garage where she swept and mopped offices and bathrooms between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Campbell was also ordered to pay her maid's medical expenses and to attend a two-day anger management program. But just a year later, Campbell was banned from flying on British Airways after an incident at Heathrow's Terminal 5. The 37-year-old model was arrested on suspicion of assaulting a police officer and later released on bail after being removed from a flight to Los Angeles. Britain's police traditionally patrol without firearms, but Liverpool's gangland wars of the mid-90s were so violent that Mersey police took the unusual step of taking to the streets fully armed. Officers needed protection against the hardened gangs that were fighting over control of the city's nightclubs and drug distribution. 
The explosive dispute led to the shooting death of David Ungi, the head of a powerful local family, in May 1995. A further nine shootings rocked Liverpool as the gangs retaliated against each other. What concerns me is the lowering of the threshold of what used to be unacceptable behavior where people are now willing to use firearms whereas perhaps in the in the past they would have used fists or knives. Ungi's lawyer denied he was a criminal. What I have to say is that in any major city in this country there are obviously criminal elements some more organized than others but I'm not aware as a solicitor who's been practicing here for 20 years of any organized mafia in this city. Certainly in my conversations with senior police officers, there's been no suggestion that my clients are part of a criminal mafia. But the godfathers of crime in Liverpool had access to some of the deadliest weapons. One police raid netted four Uzi machine guns. Carrying weapons has suddenly become a fashion accessory to those people of that kind of mind who feel that they must carry weapons and flaunt them and every now and then fire them off. Doctors at the city hospital were appalled with the wounds they had to deal with. We've seen uh, people with uh, shotgun wounds to the back which have penetrated into the chest and have collapsed both lungs. We've seen uh, shotgun pellets and wounds spread all around the, the limbs. We've seen uh, limbs almost uh, taken off uh, with shotgun sprays. Uh, we've obviously seen uh, chest injuries of all sorts. Some of them requiring the chests to actually be opened, uh, but many of them just requiring to be taken to the operating theater very, very quickly. But it was the emotional wounds inflicted on the locals that concerned community leaders. The great majority of people in Toxteth are not uh, lawbreakers. They are not violent people. They are not involved in criminal gangs or anything like that. Uh, and their lives are being disrupted by what they see going on around them. And the fear is one part of the community would be turned against another. Uh, there's no reason why it should, but when people are feeling insecure, then all sorts of things can result. As the main port of entry for illegal firearms and drug importation, Liverpool continues to be a hotspot for violent crime and home to some of Britain's most trigger-happy criminals.